Hi, this is Jonathan Jay. On every episode of DMA TV, I'm interviewing people involved in the world of business buying. From professional deal makers to the advisors behind the scenes who make it happen. They all have the information, strategies and tactics to help you buy a business successfully. Today, we'll be meeting John Graves from YB Investments. Now, I first met John earlier this year, and in the last 12 months, he's bought three businesses, and today we're going to find out how he's done it. So, welcome, John. Thank you. Can I start by asking you, we've worked together for a little while now, what you would say is the number one tip that you would give someone watching this who is thinking about buying a business? Okay, uh, there's a little bit of preparation and learning but I think the biggest thing is taking action and just getting on with it, making the opportunities, looking at the opportunities. If you're not on it and you're not focused on it, it doesn't happen. So you need to just get on with it, stop the procrastination <laughs> and get those deals in. So what do you feel that people procrastinate over? I, I, the, the, the small details are probably the biggest thing. Yeah. Um, we send a lot of letters. Um, it doesn't matter on the small details of the colour of an envelope. It's about volume and it's about mass marketing. So it's about just getting it out there and getting the response and repetition of that instead of focusing on a small detail that a motivated seller might not notice anyway. So sometimes I speak to, to people interested in buying a business and they say, well, I haven't found the right business to buy and I, you know, it, it's, it's just not happening. I, you know, I can't find a deal. And I say, well, how many people have you actually sat down with and had a conversation? They go, oh, like one. <laughs> so, so that's the reason why, isn't it? Yeah, we sign an NDA probably every day at the moment. Yep. So we're probably f looking at at least five opportunities every single week, um, which means our flow of opportunities is fantastic and we really can pick what is going to work for us. And I think you were saying to me earlier that you actually had to turn off the tap at one point yeah. because you were getting so many inbound inquiries you just couldn't deal with each of them effectively. Yeah, it, it got to the point where we couldn't look after the opportunities that we had and nurse those opportunities and make sure that we gave each one the right amount of attention because we had too many more coming through. So the new ones were, we were slow to respond, we couldn't take the action that we needed to do. And therefore we, we kind of switched the, the outbound marketing of our acquisitions off so that we could focus on really dealing with the, the, the people that were getting in touch quickly, efficiently, and making sure that we knew what we were doing and we were professional. Because the reality is how you respond to people is gonna, make the make the difference on on whether they're going to want to do a deal or not i suppose having too many potential deals is a good problem to have if you're going to have a problem it's not a bad problem to have it is it, i suppose it's a it's a nice op nice thing to look at a lot of businesses it means that you can look and pick something up quite quickly understand whether it's right or it's wrong um, so it's it's useful looking at lots of opportunities you have to make sure that if it's a bad opportunity you remove it very quickly and you just discount it and move on. Now, I believe that you found your niche in distressed acquisitions from administrators. And when we were at one of the workshops, I think that you had the whole room in silence when you told everyone about a business that you'd bought from the administrators. Could you give us just some, some broad outline of, of what that deal looked like? Okay, so... Uh, it was a hotel and golf club. Uh, it was distressed. Uh, HMRC were owed a considerable amount of money, uh, and it was going into a pre-pack situation. Uh, we were we were actually working on a different deal with the same administrator that didn't go ahead, um, and then he suggested that we have a look at, at the golf club. So we picked it up. Um, I play golf, so I had a base understanding of how the business would work, but I've never run a hotel or a golf club. There is a management structure in place, so. It didn't mean we had to go really hands-on into the business. We had to give it direction and leadership instead. Uh, we could see where the pain points were, why it wasn't working, uh, and therefore we, we kind of moved forward. Uh, we made sure that we were communicating with the administrator properly, quickly, efficiently. We don't send an email and wait for a response. Sure. If we have to send an email, we follow up with a phone call the same day within hours to make sure that they've got it and make sure that they're dealing with what they need to so that we look like we're ready to do a deal. The administration process is a quick process and you need to make sure that you're 
in it ready and, and willing to do the deal as quickly as they can do it. And what was the amount of time between finding out about this golf club opportunity and owning the business? Approximately seven days. Um, it came to us on the Tuesday. We made an offer uh, on the Wednesday. Um, the offer was accepted. Um, we met with the, the former owner now, Tom, on the Thursday. Um, and we completed on the following Thursday. So seven, eight days, start to finish. That's pretty good. Yeah. So you, uh, you you wake up one morning and you own a, uh, a golf club and a hotel. Yeah. Um, what have been the challenges that you've seen? Because these things aren't plain sailing, are they? No, uh, when you buy a leasehold business, you, you, you inherit certain things that you have to deal with. There'd been a lack of investment for a long time. The hotel was in a, in, a, in a poor condition. Seven toilets didn't work on the first day. And of course, we then asked the staff, well, what, what do you do when a customer complains? Well, we discount the room. We don't do that anymore. We, we fix the problem. Um, so when we took, we completed about lunchtime on the Thursday, there was a plumber on site by one o'clock on Thursday, and we had seven working toilets ready for a full weekend. <laughs> so it's, it's about just dealing with problems as they arise. There wasn't a long time to do due diligence. We had to take it as we saw it. We only bought the assets, so we didn't, didn't do a lot of due diligence. So all the behind. HMRC liabilities were left behind yep. uh, and they just went away in the administration and you had the assets free and clear. Yeah, uh, we did have a problem. Um, so a lot of the assets were on lease. Um, and of course, effectively those debts die with the administration process as well, which leaves us with a hotel with no beds, no furniture that we have to then go and do a deal with the with the the, the leasing companies for um, some of them were pretty flexible some of them weren't mm -hmm. um, so it meant that although we bought it relatively cheaply we had to manage cash flow from the first day because we had to go and do deals with these leasing companies to ensure that we didn't just have a hotel with no furniture we had a hotel that we could trade properly um, so there was a little bit of pain at the start sorting out lease agreements that they got tied up in um, a lease seems great on day one because you don't have to pay a lot of money for something. But if you take 10 leases, you've got 10 payments to make every month. Sure. And they build up and build up and you get a cash crunch and it all falls over. Uh, and that is effectively what had happened. So we had to break each one down, work out if we needed the equipment that was on the lease, make them an offer and get those closed off as well. So we did a deal with the administrator, then had to do 10 or 11 further deals with every single leasing company. So it, it dragged on a little bit to make sure that we could trade properly. So I seem to remember being very impressed with the way you structured the financials of this deal. Yeah. And of course, the administrator wants some money for the assets. So it's their responsibility to return the best, best possible uh, outcome to the creditors. Uh, so clearly some money changed hands. I mean, you don't have to tell us what it was, um, but it, there was a sum of money. Yeah. But you actually had a really clever way of getting that money back. Would you explain that to us? Okay, so because we were buying physical assets in a golf club, it, it was pretty simple of tractors and lawnmowers. Um, so that's effectively what we bought off the administrator. It meant that we could go and get asset finance relatively easily because there was an asset there to, that we just bought. So. Um, we effectively refinanced the asset uh, within a week of, of taking ownership uh, and, and pulled most of our money back out. So the money that you put in to buy the assets, you got most of it back out within, within a week. week or so. Yeah. That's pretty clever, isn't it? Yeah, it was, it was certainly helpful. Um, it, it meant that we had additional cash to cash flow the business mm -hmm. where there was leases and stuff that we needed to do. So it actually was really beneficial for the business because where it did need a little bit of help, we had that flexibility to give it as well. And I suppose if, if you've got a business where you can buy the assets, refinance the assets, get your money back, that gives you infinite upside, doesn't it? So you can actually do that again and again and again yeah. because you're not putting all your capital into one deal and never seeing it again or maybe not seeing it for years. You're actually seeing a, a very far, you're recycling your cash, aren't yeah, you? It means you can do multiple deals with, yeah. with one pot of money instead of putting your money in waiting six months 12 months two years three years to get that back you're effectively getting your money back really quickly to then look at the next opportunity and that's what happened 
uh, because obviously we completed on another deal. Yeah, within the within, within thirty days, days right? The first <laughs> yeah. One. So, yeah, yeah. So tell us about that. How did that come about? So that was an IT company, um, software company. We were on a course. Uh, yeah, we were run. together on the workshop. Yeah, and, and an opportunity was presented to actually two people on the course independently, uh, me and Stephen. Um, he comes from a software background. I came from a telecoms background, uh, which is really what the business needed, um, and so. Uh, that was nine o'clock in the morning. I remember, um, yeah. The director of the business came to meet us at one o'clock. Yeah, you went out of the workshop, we you got a, a side room in the hotel. We did, and, and by, by five o'clock, we, we'd taken ownership of the business. So um, that was a six hour due diligence process, not a seven day one. Sure. But we were prepared to put the money in, prepared to take action, and therefore the administrator gave us that opportunity to get that deal done. And I recall, I mean, they they were reasonably nominal amounts of money, weren't they, between yeah. between you and Stephen? You're talking the price of a car. You're not talking a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand. Yeah. So you're not risking the family house no. to buy this business. No, me and Stephen put a, a nominal amount in each to buy that business fifty fifty. Uh, it has repaid that already. Uh, the the way that business was structured, the customers prepaid. So the reality was if the customers didn't repay, we would just switch them off. So there was no risk to us and our investment. We weren't having to subsidize any costs. Um, so it was a, a pretty easy deal for us and a, mm -hmm. and a de-risked situation because if, if no customer re-signed with us, it wasn't a problem because yes, we'd lost some at the start, but we hadn't lost six figures or seven figures. We'd lost the price of a family car at home. Yeah, that's fa that's fantastic. Much easier to convince the wife. Absolutely, I'm sure it was. So let's. Um, I, I recall from a conversation earlier, you said that you reached a point round about that time where your your brain was filling up <laughs> uh, and you had so much happening and so much on that you need to needed to reevaluate how you managed your time. Yeah. So can we talk about that for a moment? Because I think that's a, a very useful topic to discuss because okay. sometimes people say, oh, I can't buy a business because if I buy a business, you know, my own business is running me ragged. If I've got two businesses, oh my goodness, I'd be awake 24 hours a day. So how have you dealt with that? I suppose the biggest learning curve I've had is about letting go. Um, it's about understanding that you can't do everything in a business and you have to allow other people to take on responsibility. I think a lot of business owners, me included, uh, as you grow a business slowly, you, you take on the accounts, you take on the sales, you take on the, the customer management, the support, and that's okay in a small team, in a small business, but as you scale, that, that falls over. Um, acquiring two businesses in 30 days meant that I couldn't now do everything in three different businesses at once. Mm -hmm. We had to try and control it. So we got to a point where it was, it was hard. Um, there wasn't much capacity left to do much, and we had to make changes, uh, and we had to look at how I was investing my time, where the, the wastage was, and how we made myself more efficient. So you gave me a very good example of one way of making yourself more efficient <laughs> because you were spending a lot of time driving around the country. Your investments were in different parts of the country. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of firefighting in the early days with a distressed acquisition. So how have you eased up your, your time? <laughs> so we, we looked at where the biggest waste of time was. And, and when I'm sat in a meeting, it's productive. When I'm at, in the office, it's productive. The, the time that we were wasting was the travel time. We bought a hotel and golf club that was two and a half hours from our from our main business and our home. So that's, if I go for a day, there's five hours wasted already. Um, I've still got customers to see, I've got deals to be done as well. Every time I was on the road, it was a waste of time. It was, it was time that was being spent getting tired on the road, getting frustrated by traffic jams. We needed to do something about it. Um, and therefore we effectively got a driver, uh, put me in the back of the van instead of driving. Uh, and put, we worked out in the first week, 35 hours of, of my time back in the business on day one. So we effectively gained a week of productivity for every week I work, which is phenomenal. So it's I, incredible, you're, dub you're doubling your output, aren't yeah, you? For the same amount of hours worked, I've doubled my output. Um, a, lot of, a lot of business people will work late in, at night, they'll stay in the office late, they'll go back to the office, they'll work from home. By having that extra product of time, I don't now have to work at home anymore. I don't go to the office anymore. We've effectively made my lifestyle better, my family life better, the business is better by removing the dead time during the day because I don't have to go and catch up in the evening anymore because instead of working till 10 o'clock at night, I've done five, six hours of, of work time while I'm on the road. So 
That's phenomenal. So let's just compare this to what typical business owners do, which is they work longer and longer hours, harder and harder. They go into the office at the weekends and they only just make ends meet. So how is being a deal maker, being a business investor different to that? What's the different mindset? It's gone from a, an operational perspective and trying to run a business to trying to give some foresight to a business and direction. So instead of getting caught up and procrastinating in doing payroll or paying an invoice or looking at the accounts, it's changed from that mindset to a, let's get the P&L done. Let's mm -hmm. check the P&L. Are we profitable? Where's the next direction? How's the marketing getting on? How's the sales coming on? It's now a much more top level board kind of view instead of a nitty gritty underneath view. And therefore it makes you more efficient because there's, if you can go and buy a business that's already got some structure in and improve that structure, you're better than trying to do it all yourself, which is what I said before about letting go. Sure. Um, and we've taken what we've seen. I don't know how to run a hotel. I don't want to run a hotel. I want my staff to run a hotel. And it, it's meant that we've also then looked at our core business and said, well, hold on, John's doing that. He shouldn't be doing that. That's, that's, that's a waste of time. We should employ someone to do that. So it's then changed our setup internally in our main core business by trying to remove me out of the, effectively, the final nitty gritty day to day jobs that we should be paying someone to do anyway. So that's really interesting. So the process of buying a business and allowing management to manage that business have actually shown you where you were doing things you shouldn't really have been doing in yeah. your existing business and that's that's very interesting because it's the opposite of what many people think you see what many people think is if they buy a business they're just doubling up the number of hours they have to work if they buy three businesses they're tripling the number of hours they have to work they'll be working seven days a week but in actual fact you've released more time you've got more spare time for yourself you don't work evenings anymore in fact it's the complete reversal of what people think it's counterintuitive but it's what yeah, it's the opposite. Yeah, we've as, as we've scaled, uh, we've effectively added two and a half million pounds to our group in in a month. But the benefit of that is that we've we've reduced my time and my investment time into going and look at further deals instead of worrying about whether that customer has been had his service delivered on time or whether something yeah. is late or whether the post has come or whether. Uh, there's so many things that business owners get caught up on and, and, and I'm not going to sit here and preach that I don't still get caught up on stuff because I do but it's about trying to make the time that you have work as best as you can uh, and, and, and I was wasting hours and hours well 35 hours in a week driving up and down the UK going to meetings and appointments uh, and, and, and that thankfully I'm, don't get me wrong I'm still driving around but I'm in the back working Absolutely. instead of doing the yeah. mileage uh, and, and we've basically doubled our capacity so where we were really constrained and I was getting to a not a burnout level but a, a my mental capacity is no no more I can't do anymore yeah we're now at a point well hold on I could run three organizations while I had no time but I've now got another 35 hours so all of a sudden we can look at the next opportunity and we're not still stuck in there oh well hold on we're not going to be able to get this done. We're not going to get that done. This is going to get delayed. We've solved that problem by being efficient at what we do. So don't you think that many business owners actually become a victim of telling themselves they don't have any time and just doing the same thing day in, day out? And if they could elevate themselves out of that operational mode, they could achieve so much more. And did you say you added with those two acquisitions within the 30 day period, was it two and a half million yeah. to, the, to your group revenue? Yeah. So and this is a slightly leading question because I think we both know the answer, but if you wanted to go from, say, two and a half to, to 10 million of revenue, is it more Facebook ads, more salespeople, or is it acquisitions? It's, it's acquisition. It is easier to buy a million pounds worth of revenue than it is to go and earn a million pounds worth of revenue. Um, and don't get me wrong, our telecoms, we have internal sales and we look for that organic growth, but the reality is it, it's, it's, it's much more efficient to go and find another company and merge in than it is to try and sell product to 100, 200 new customers. Um, so acquisition wins every time. And is it more fun? Yeah. <laughs> a business owners get into a point where they start to grind. It becomes a chore. It becomes a job. You get a bit bored. You get a bit frustrated. By going out and doing deals, I got the buzz back. I felt 
on edge again. I felt like I was working for something again. There was a challenge. It was something different. Instead of it being a job, it became let's build the group. Let's let's look for that next deal. Yeah. So there was an adrenaline rush when you get the deal done instead of it just being another day in the office. And because every deal is different, I guess that buzz will never go away for you no. because there's always a new challenge. Uh, there's always something new to learn, a new deal structure and so forth. Yeah, I mean, the, the hotel and golf club is a huge challenge for us because we've never done it. Uh, we've had to second one of our staff into there to help run it on a day-to-day -day basis. So they're enjoying the new challenge because it's something different for them as well. So mm. it, it keeps the staff of the whole group motivated because there's always something new and something different coming in. Um, and it, as I said, it just grows the business so much quicker. So as you know, I always say to people, you outsource your accountancy, you outsource your tax, you outsource your, your legal work. And then some people say, well, if, you, if you're outsourcing all of those, all those aspects of a deal, what do, you, what do you do? So how would you describe your role then as a deal maker? What, what is it that you do that makes this happen that actually is your role, the, 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 the aspects of buying a business that you want to do yourself? I suppose if we look at the insolvency route, because that's where we are focused at the moment, it's taking the action, it's leading it. Um, I, I can't do the legals. I can't, I'm not... I'm not a solicitor, um, so I can't go and draft a 40 or 50 page document, but I can get into a position where we're ready to do that. And actually on an insolvency process, it's so quick that you, know, you don't get caught up in those little details. It's very structured, it's very static. That's a document, you take it or leave it. So you're outsourcing and you're using people, but it's just about getting that deal done quickly getting on the phone and making sure everyone knows where they're supposed to be, chasing the administrators so they know that you want to do the deal and you're keen because they need to be as invested in you as a buyer as mm -hmm. they are in getting paid because the reality is they need to be able to move it on and they get approaches from, I'm sure, hundreds of people yes, on every deal yeah. um, and they have to be able to differentiate and by sending an email doesn't get you anywhere. By getting an NDA and taking three days to send the NDA back, doesn't help because mm. they're looking and thinking well hold on it, 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 we've got to do this in 10 days it's taken him three days just to sign a piece of paper and send it back he's not going to be able to do this deal whenever we get an NDA it's signed within an hour and sent back we will stop everything to get that NDA signed because that's the first test that anyone will look at to see if you're actually going to deal with this quickly or if you're going to be really slow. Absolutely. I, I feel it's as much a, a test of the buyer's capability to get a deal done as it is about confidentiality. Yeah. I, I mean, the confidentiality you, you have to understand, but it's just, it's a gate that you have to get through and get over. Uh, and as I said, we probably sign one a day at the moment, if not more. Um, and that doesn't mean I'm going to go and buy a business every day. It means we're looking at the opportunities. We probably discount 50% as soon as we get the first information on the business for for whatever reason but it's about looking at the opportunities knowing what you're after and and then being able to start creating how you think the be the business will work long term uh, and then really trying to flow it from there and just being on it all of the time so it's it's a much more direct quick approach than a, a slow three-month purchase sure so what would you say are the personality traits of a of a successful <laughs> deal maker um, Confidence. I think mm -hmm. you've got to believe in your ability. Probably a little bit of arrogance. If we, I probably crossed the line a little bit. Um, but you've got to know. You've got to get that balance right. Uh, you've got to believe that you can do the deal. If you don't, it's not going to matter. Uh, we've done a, a standard kind of a transaction where it was a share purchase as well. And you've got to believe that you can get that deal done because if you don't, it's never going to get over the line. Mm -hmm. And the, the seller has got to buy into you. Yes, absolutely. If they don't buy into what you're doing, it, yeah. you're never going to get that deal done. Yes. So you've got to get that balance right and you've got to just take action, be on it, be focused, try and give them as much information as they need because they need to believe in you while you're getting what you need off them. Um, so bit of bit of confidence and just really focusing on what you want to do understanding the end goal and going for it not getting caught up in little things here and there pay other people to do it pay your solicitor to go and argue with the other side solicitor that's what they're there to do don't worry about mm. the fees a solicitor's going to charge if you get caught up in whether a solicitor is is three grand or six grand or ten grand 
you, you need to kind of make a decision on whether you're actually prepared to put your money into a deal to start with. They're there to save you money and save you grief. Yeah. Stop arguing on fees. And I, mean, I, I, I find it always deal. incredible. Everyone says, I want to buy a multi-million pound business. I, I want to be a multi-millionaire. And I want my fees to be a fiver. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's right. They don't want to pay any money no. for it. it, it, it it's just part of, of, of business, isn't it? Yeah. It's a cost of doing business. Pe people have a, a, a cost perspective and a, an expectation. And no one wants to pay fees, do they? No, I don't want to pay a solicitor. I don't want to pay my account. But if they're good at what they do, they save you time, they save yeah. you effort. Well, there's a cost to not paying them, isn't there? Yeah. And uh, so you, you, you pay more tax than you should do. You don't get the right deal, deal. and so forth. Yeah. yeah. So you, you've got to stop trying to argue with the small things and focus on the bigger things. The bigger thing is getting a deal done. Mm. The fact that the solicitor might be charging you six instead of five grand. Well, do you know, if the deal's going to give you a million quid with the revenue next week, Suck it up it's and get a on with it. Price to pay, yeah. isn't it? Stop arguing and stop looking for the cheap deal with the solicitor. Get to know a solicitor. Our solicitors is fantastic. Uh, John, we approached John before we did the first insolvency deal um, because I wanted to understand what the administrator would be looking for from us before I spoke to the administrator. So we engaged with our solicitor quite early on in the process to find out where we should be looking at on an insolvency deal because we hadn't done one before. John then gave us lots of information about you need to go and find out this, ask the administrator that, what's happening with this, what's happening with that. So all of a sudden we had a, a, a effectively a, a cheat sheet of information. So the first time we spoke to the administrator on the phone, we had that information ready to go. So all of a sudden he knew we were deadly serious about buying it. We knew exactly what to ask for. They hadn't, I hadn't agreed a fee with John at that point. I hadn't agreed that he was gonna even act for us. It's about building a relationship with the solicitor so that when you need information, you can just pick up the phone and get it. So I think what you've just been saying, John, ties into these these four quadrants with the, the, the four elements that you need to be good at buying a business. You need to have the knowledge. So you need to know what you're doing. You need the confidence mm. because it's no good having the knowledge without the confidence to sit down with the, the, the seller of the business and you can't have the conversation. So you need that confidence. You need the team, you need the, the right team around you, the right professionals, and you need the deal flow. And it sounds to me like you've, you've got all four in place. And as a result of having all four in place, that's why you're seeing the success that you're seeing. Yeah, we've 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 built a process now that we can we can manage and, and, and push through and it's given us a lot of opportunities that we can look at. We don't have to do any of them. It's about getting the right opportunity and I'd rather look at five, ten in a week and discount five or ten in a week than not look at any and be stuck going, Well there's no business to buy. There are loads of businesses to buy. Um, Brexit we discussed earlier is is a fantastic thing for, for for acquisition because it gives sellers an excuse of why their business isn't working. Yes, and 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 that's a great point for us at the moment. And and if someone wants to blame Brexit for their business failing, comfortable with that, as long as we can see how we can change it, uh, and and therefore speak to as many vendors as you can, speak to business owners, network, just get out there and, and the, the deals will come. Um, you don't have to rush into it. It took us, we bought our first business in November last year. It then took us till September this year to do another one. It was about finding the right deal. We sure. found it and we closed it off in seven days. So what does the future hold for you then? Um, more acquisitions. Uh, we we are continuing to offer. We made an offer last week on one, but unfortunately we didn't get it. Uh, we will continue to look at insolvency deals, uh, but we will also look at a, a, a more structured standard kind of purchase. Um, we want to grow all of our businesses. We want to grow our core telecoms and IT, um, but we will look at any business that's out there that has, has, has got something. It's just lacking something else. If we think we can sure. put that in there, then we'll do the deal on it. Um, so it's going to be an interesting two or three years ahead. Um, but but we've been aggressive, we've focused, we know where we want to take it and, and, and we'll take action to get there. Very exciting, exciting times. John Graves, thank you very much. So that was John Graves from YB Investments. Next time on DMA TV, you'll be meeting another deal maker with another story. Till then, goodbye. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit the subscribe button and click here to watch more videos about buying a business.